A hey, very good morning and thank you very much for joining us on GBS Morning Extra. It is the eighth day of the month of October 2019 and we're glad that you joined us. If you'd like to give us any comments, suggestions or opinion, you can do this through our SMS line. That's 21144. You can send us an email on info at gbskenya.com or you can keep the conversation going on our social media platform. That is through the Twitter handle which is at Kenya GBS or our hashtag is GBS Morning Extra. My name is Timothy Omondi. Welcome aboard. To start us off this morning, we start with some politics where leaders affiliated to the Kieleweke function of the Jubilee Party have asked Kibra constituents to uh, vote for the Orange Democratic Movement candidate Bernard Imran Okot in the November elect in the November 7th by election the leaders claim that Imran has the backing of president Uhuru Kenyatta Wangoi Wamboi has more on that story led by nominated MP Maina Kamanda Igembe North MP Mauka Maore former Nairobi Assembly speaker Beatrice Elachi and former Dagoretti South MP Dennis Waweru they said Jubilee's McDonald Mariga is sponsored by people opposed to the political pact between President and ODM leader Raila Odinga. Jubilee's candidate, McDonald Mariga, said his focus, if elected, will be on empowering women and the youth economically, increasing electricity supply, and giving bursaries to the needy. The great South MP, John Carrier, said the huge crowd that attended Mariga's rally showed he would easily triumph and that locals were thirsty for development. Speaking in Kibra, Amani National Congress, ANC leader Musalia Mudavadi, appealed to the government to investigate claims that there were people buying identity cards in Kibra, warning that if not dealt with, it would exclude many voters. He also called for a review of all the laws that bar Kenyans with dual citizenship from serving in government, saying they are retrogressive at a time the diaspora community is remitting to the country about 200 billion shillings annually. This comes the National Assembly attempted to bar a Basindorio MP to South Korea, Mwenda Mwenzi, from assuming the position on claims that she had dual nationality. A judgment by High Court Judge David Majanja introduced an aspect that could affect even members of the National Assembly. What Mudava defines as retrogressive is the Chapter 6 of 2010 Constitution, which bars any person holding a dual citizenship from assuming public office. Kwa education and health facilities, Katika Kibira, what will have happened to Kibira? Reporting for GBS Morning Extra, Mongo Yumbue. Now, moving on from politics, a section of the Tika Superhighway was rendered impassable on Monday afternoon by the Kenyatta University students. The students were protesting what they termed as frustration by the university administration on various issues. Among the issues raised by the students is the move by the administration to impose a fine on students paying school fees past the deadline. Now, moving on from that, we cross over to Njoro, where an inferno has destroyed residential houses and businesses at the Musho Wa Lami Trading Center in Mao Narok. According to the residents, the inferno started at a petrol station and spread quickly while the residents tried to put it out. Nakuru firefighters have been dispatched to contain it. Njoro Sub County Police Commissioner Mohamed Huko said that there were no casualties uh, reported in the incident. <laughs> We cross over now to the central part of the country where the Auditor General, uh, after ordering the audit of the Kenya Tea Development Agency accounts to establish what caused the, de the decline in bonus payments. Justice uh, Kanye Kimondo 
of Moranga High Court gave uh, the order after the county government failed a petition, filed a petition on Monday seeking to establish the cause of the drop. The uh, county governor, uh, Wairia, led protesters to the court as they protested the deepening of the prizes. The county, which was represented by seven lawyers, said this year's bonus had declined by about 2.6 billion Kenya shillings from last year. <laughs> Now, in what may seem to be an answer to these questions that uh, the tea farmers in the country, or rather in Moranga, are trying to find, the Kenya Tea Development Agency, KTDA, has been recognized for being the second best agency in tea pricing for their farmers in the world markets as Sri Lanka removes it from the top position that it held last year. Let's listen in to this story by Beatrice. The tea industry report released last week indicates that Kenya Tea Development Agency, KTDA, which manages small-scale farmers, paid an average of 41.27 shillings per kilogram. Despite the pricing, KTDA was relegated to second place as Sri Lanka Tea Board took the first position paying its farmers 48.27 shillings. Both agencies, however, recorded a drop in prices compared with the last financial year. KTDA Managing Director Lerion Katiampati said despite a myriad of challenges, they remained at the top in payment of their farmers. Kolkata Tea Auction in India was pronounced the best trading center for Black City tea brand in the world, with a payment of an average price of 264 shillings per kilo, followed by Mombasa at 244 shillings. Crash Tea Kal, referred to as CTC, is a method of processing black tea in which the leaves are passed through a series of cylindrical rollers with hundreds of sharp teeth that crush tea and cull the tea into small, hard pallets. Efforts by tea directorates to have Kenyans consume more tea have not been fruitful over the years, with the figure stagnating at a worthless 4%. Perhaps this is driven by what the tea industry players have said is low quality production by farmers, hurting the prices made by the commodity in the international market. African Tea Trade Association said Kenya's black tea is among those with the lowest asking price at the Mombasa weekly sale, compared to Rwandan tea, which has the highest profits. Kenya well, quite uh, ironic there. The country, though, we can see that the dwindling prices have actually affected the uh, Kenya in terms of its positioning in the world market, uh, deepening and allowing Sri Lanka to take the first position. That means Kenya was relegated to the second position. Well, we move on to other matters now across the borders. As the common saying goes, education is the key to success. To many, this may sound like a cliche, but to one Koat Reth, a refugee and a teacher, at the same time, these words mean the world. Reth, who now lives in Jewi refugee camp in Ethiopia, decided to ignore his sorry state and focus on teaching refugee children in the camp. Here is his story. Meet Koat Reth, a South Sudanese refugee now living in Ethiopia's Jewi refugee camp. Here, he is also known as a teacher and believes that the education is key to a brighter future for his homeland that has known nothing but decades of war and armed conflict. Just like everyone else, Riyadh wants to make sure that both the young and the old are ready to take part in rebuilding the education system in his country. I love this teaching because I want to forward the young generation to be the good children in the future. With almost a decade of teaching under his belt, Riyadh knows a thing or two about holding his students' attention. I teach them with a different language and with a different song. 
I teach them with and a little English to know. The classes are overcrowded here and there are not enough textbooks, but Riyat does not complain. The reaction of his students is seemingly positive despite the many challenges they go through. I like how he teaches and he's very funny. I like that. The 41-year-old South Sudanese refugee teacher has energy levels that easily match those of the children in his class with whom he shares a difficult past. I'm teaching these children to be the doctor and the free student and the pilot. So this is my role to volunteer myself to teach these children to be the good future in the South Sudan, to do a good thing. He is one of over two million refugees from South Sudan who wants to better the future of education without giving up. You. In the morning time, I'm going to teach the children. But in the afternoon, I come to teach the adult people. How many women? How many? How many? Women? Women? Are there? Are there? How many children? How many children? Are there? Are there? In this school? In this school. What are the children doing? I'm tired, but um, I cannot uh, uh, say that I'm tired because I'm for, for wanting the, the people to be like me or to be like other people who are here in the world. Riyadh may soon live to see his dream fulfilled if the opposing political sides in South Sudan actualize the peace agreement signed in May 2019 in Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa that called for the formation of a transitional government of national unity that is expected to be formed by November 2019. Once the transitional government of national unity is formed, South Sudan is expected to hold a general election in 30 months. Well, it is indeed quite hopeful to see that uh, despite the bad living conditions that some of these people are subjected to, they actually still can find meaning to life and do something with hope. Indeed, we also hope that uh, as the leaders watch this, they will also rethink their decisions. We have seen the South Sudan has had a history of negating or of overlooking and uh, ab aboting uh, peace deals that have been signed in the past. In 2016, the uh, former Deputy President Rick Machar fell, fell apart with his uh, president, that is Salva Kiir, and the country was plunged back into civil war that has cost thousands of lives. And uh, about, I think, a year ago, uh, South Sudan was actually included in uh, among the states like Syria that have sent out more refugees, two million plus refugees since the beginning of the conflict. And indeed, we do hope that as they form the transitional government of national unity this coming November, that all will be well once again. And once they form the transitional government, ac actually according to the agreement that they signed in Addis Ababa, they have about uh, 30 months to form the government, which we hope that will pave way also for a general election, a democratic general election. Well, we move on now to other matters. The United Nations Security Council uh, met uh, on October the 7th to discuss peace and security in Africa, the certainty to prevention, to preventive diplomatic uh, conflicts, prevention and resumption meeting uh, that was convened under the South African presidency this month, emphasized on the council's role in cooperation with regional and sub-regional organizations. Speaking at the, as the guest of the Security Council meeting from Tanzania, Ambassador Liberata Mulam Mulamula uh, addressed the uh, absence of women uh, participation in, form in form formal mediation processes as uh, he, she addressed the 1325th Agenda. Uh, Our largest peacekeeping missions are on the African continent, and more than 80,000 peacekeepers serve there. 
and Africa is now the largest troop contributing region. We owe these blue helmets our strong and united support through robust funding and strong mandates. I commend the Council's cooperation with the African Union, including with the AU's Peace and Security Council. Across the continent, the United Nations is working in steadfast and close cooperation with the African Union and African sub-regional organizations to prevent and resolve conflicts. Violence against women remains the most, perhaps, the most pervasive human rights violation in the African continent and in the region in particular. The absence of and lack of African women participation in informal mediation processes at the peace table in particular is an important area of the UN Security Council 1325 agenda that remains poorly implemented. The African Women Leaders Network and FEMWISE are at your disposal, Mr. Secretary General, when you are searching for able and qualified women to assist in your good offices and diplomatic efforts. And indeed, as they discuss the matter before the end of October, that is this month, the Council is due to be briefed on the Secretary General's annual report on the UN-AU strategic partnership. Moving on now to other matters, the UN Refugee Agency has called on European Union to provide more support for Greece. The situation is critical as it is already five times its usual capacity at a nearby informal settlement because about 100 refugees are sharing a single toilet. Let's listen in to the next story. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, is calling on Greece to urgently move thousands of asylum seekers out of dangerously overcrowded reception centers on the Greek Asian islands. Sea arrivals in September, mostly comprising of Afghan and Syrian families, increased to 10,258, probably the highest monthly level since 2016, worsening conditions on the islands which now host about 30,000 asylum seekers. The situation is critical as it is already five times its usual capacity at a nearby informal settlement because a hundred people are sharing a single toilet. Compared to Spain, Italy, Malta and Cyrus, Greece has received the majority of arrivals summing up to 45,600 of 77,400. The UN Refugee Agency has called on European Union to provide more support to Greece. <laughs> Reporting for GBS Morning Extra, I'm Wawira Doreen. Well, that piece brings us to the end of our uh, segment this morning. We, before we take a short break, let's look at today in history and then we'll take a short break. Then we'll be back. Today, my guest in studio is none other than David Ogot, the director of goinghome.com, an organization that is working towards helping uh, recovering alcoholics. <laughs>